<laughs> this week on Sportsman TV, grocery shopping, South Louisiana style. Sacale, filet mignon of the freshwater world right there. As good eating as it gets. Scale on, scale off, it doesn't make any difference. As good as it gets. Well, I think the biggest reason to be excited about cyclic fishing in the springtime, and I even know this from my past, that is the prime time. You know, the, the serious die-hard crappie and cyclic fishermen, like Mr. Murphy, they fish them year round. And, and you know what, more power to them to do that. But for somebody with maybe not as much patience in cyclic fishing like myself, I want to go when they're biting. And without a doubt, you know, especially when they're starting to relate shallow and getting ready to spawn and uh, during the spawn and early in the year and the weather's so nice. I mean, this is, to me, if you were going to pick one time to do it and you weren't a die hard, this is definitely the time to do it. Like right now, they should be on the bank. So you would generally just try to fish the bank and look for cypress trees. You want to fish your cypress trees and tupelos if they have tupelos. Because that's where the fish like to spawn. They like to spawn around tupelos and cypress. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm very surprised that we're catching fish in here. But, you know, of course, uh, anything is predictable. Uh, and you look for uh, water discoloration. It's got, uh, it's probably got a pretty good tint to it. You can see you jig about, uh, I would say about 10 inches in this water here. Uh, generally, that's what you look for. You know, the funny thing is I cycled fished a bunch as a kid. Like yeah. that was something my, my grandparents loved it, my right. parents loved it, right. but this is brand new. I've never fished through the lilies like that for them. A lot of people don't know about this. Yeah. You know, there's a lot well, of people that really don't know. telling this or not. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to let this show come out way later. Let me get a little bit of this before we, uh, but it is, it's really, I had heard of it, but never seen it done before. So. Oh, really? You know, I, I prefer to cast with a rod and reel. Now, I prefer to fish for anything with a rod and reel. Where Mr. Murphy, you know, today was, you know, with the jig pole. That's, to me, that's old school crappie fishing. But with the new school mentality of the way he fishes through those lilies, I guarantee there's, there's going to be a lot of people watch this show that sacule fish, crappie fish, whatever, all the time and that have never fished like that before. Because even me, I had heard of that, but never seen it done. So that was a cool thing to, you know, to pull those crappie. I bass fish that way a lot. More times than not on the bass, regardless of how deep it is under the mat, they're normally right underneath it. What really amazed me today was how deep the crappie were. They were all the way on the bottom in nine feet of water under the mat. I, honestly, I probably would have never, even if I had fished through the mat for them, I probably wouldn't have fished on the bottom. You know, whatever it may be, the cool thing was he had them dialed in. We pulled right up on them this morning and start catching them. And yes, I'm taking them all home with me. It's spring of the year and we're going cycle fishing or crappie fishing or even white perch fishing, whichever one you'd like to refer to them as. I like to refer to them as the filet mignon of the freshwater world. Uh, a couple things to get started. A good package of premium jig heads, maybe in about three sizes, 1 32nd, 1 16th, and 8th ounce. That'll get you pretty much any depth water, any wind conditions that you might run into. Uh, a good selection of plastic bodies, either that resemble crawfish, grass shrimp, some type of bait fish to get started with. Uh, something that's really caught on here recently is actually crappie or cycle crankbaits. Uh, this is a Strike King. It depends on if you like to pole fish or cast or whatever. There's something that's for everyone out there. It's um, relatively easy to get into. And last but not least, a good premium filet knife. Whether the manual style or the electric style that I prefer. That's the way we like to end the hunt every time here on Sportsman TV.
Uh, I've been fishing sockeye for about 40 years. I started when I was about uh, 20 years old. Uh, basically, started here in Henderson and uh, just beating the trees and kept beating them and beating them until I finally figured out how to catch them. When I ate the sockeye the first time, I knew that was the fish I wanted. <laughs> I, love to, I love to eat it, it's a good fish, and it, it, the, the fish is hard to catch. I mean, you gotta really know what you're doing to catch it. You know, it's, it's a challenge, and I love that challenge. You know, you know uh, probably the first thing I noticed fishing with Mr. Murphy was how organized all this stuff was. Like, from the time I got in his truck to drop his boat, I mean, everything is immaculate. You know, uh, maybe just a hair touch of OCD, maybe just a hair touch of it. I mean, his boat was laid out immaculate. I mean, I, honestly, I thought his boat was brand new. It was a 94 model. I mean, it looked like it just come off the showroom. <laughs> yeah, it took me quite a few years to learn how to do it, to master it, you know? Quite a few years. I would say it took me probably about 10 years to master it. I would catch a few in the beginning, uh, but I'd see a lot of people that were that been doing it for a long time that were catching a lot more than I was. So I figured I wasn't master at it yet, but I kept being persistent and I learned how to do it. He is prepared for any situation. I mean, he's he's got different weight jig heads. He's got different color jig heads. I mean, he's got from rigs with corks with no corks where he can tight line. From the custom built pole he's got, you know, to make that hole in the, in the lilies or, you know, whatever type of grass mat it is where he can fish, you know, fish through it. He, uh, he's definitely set up, you know, without a doubt. He, he does this, like he said, 365 days a year. So you say you want some filet mignon? Yes, sir. Now he's, he's 10, you don't have to measure. <laughs> <laughs> you better stop. <laughs> I know he's not 10, but I'll give you some filet mignon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I consider him a specialist. Like, he is a specialist at, you know, what he does at sackle fishing. Um, it's cool to see somebody who, you know, he, he cares that much about what he does. I went shopping, so I found some uh, fluorocarbon, which is a 17-pound test is what I'm using right now. I have some other strength string on my poles, but I'm just doing away with that. I'm using it up, and then I'm going to stick with the 17-pound uh, test fluorocarbon. The reason I like it is because the string doesn't curl up and you can feel uh, the bite a lot better. You, and then you can you watch what your string is doing. And I use the, cl the clear, clear on the uh, floor call, uh -huh. that way the fish, to me, they can't see that string like anything else. You know? I'm afraid he's fixing to tell us that that one's not long enough. No. <laughs> that one, hey, we gotta give him a chance, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you gotta give him a little break, man. I'm Richard Wagley. I'm going to talk to you about basic turkey calls. If I were just getting started, uh, I would use what, what I classify as friction type calls. Friction type calls are anything that where you rub two things together to make a sound. This is a box call. These things have been around since the Indians started hunting turkeys. They're simple to use. Just a matter of doing that. This is a box call. This is another type of box call. Uh, there again, you got you get two different surfaces you're rubbing to create that sound with. Then you have what we call slate type calls or pot calls. Uh, this one has the surface on it is slate, and you take a, a wooden dowel or there again, it, it's simple to do. If you can write your name, you can run one of these calls. Turkeys actually have their own language, and as you understand them and fool with them more and, and around them more, you, under, you begin to understand that language as well, and you know when you, when you cluck to one what that's supposed to mean, when you, when you yelp to one what that, you know, that means to the turkeys, and you can definitely overcall. There's times when you can overcall, there's times when you can undercall. It's just like duck hunting. If you're where those ducks want to be, you're a whole lot better duck hunter. Same thing with a turkey. If you're where they're wanting to go in that direction, that proximity, you can make yourself a whole lot better turkey caller.
Ryan, okay, I've been fishing under the lilies probably about 20 years. And way back when, when I started fishing the lilies, the lilies wasn't so tight and packed. You didn't have to have a hook. There's always a little hole that you could drop it in. They didn't have all that growth underneath that you had to clear up to, you know, to get your jig down in there. I think these fish are underneath, I think they stay here. I, I don't think they come and go. Because they got plenty of food down there to feed them. And uh, they're in that spawn mode, so they, they're not going to move much. So when they move in here, they here till they get they through spawning. They're here till it, til they're through spawning, exactly. See, as you can see, the stomach on this fish is real flat. Chances are it's probably already spawned. Normally that belly would be real big. This is a female right here, this one here. So she's probably already spawned. How, how do you, uh, how can you tell? Well, the, fe the female. I mean, even on, when they're flat belly, that it's a female or Well, a the male. female's got that white belly like that. Uh, they're a lot lighter color. Right, they're light, lighter color. The male's a little bit darker. That's one of the ways to tell. Sometimes in, in the middle of the, of the, the summer, it's hard to tell because they're almost all the same color. And it depends on the color water you're in also too. But usually, I can, generally I can tell because I've seen it so much, you know. This is, the, this is the easiest way I can think of. You take an open pasture, you won't have very much wildlife in it. There's not much cover there for them to hide. That, you take a, that same area and cover it in trees or in brush or, you know, and then all of a sudden you've got a lot of places for a lot more wildlife. You have a lot more food. They feel protected. You know, they can hide from predators under there. I mean, there's just, but the main thing, I think more than anything, it gives the bait a place to hide. And anytime you have lots of bait fish or, you know, a lot of crawfish, grass shrimp, whatever it may be, you know, you got a bigger food supply. And it's just like anything else, the more you feed it, you know, the bigger it grows and the more prolific. I mean, it's just a perfect situation. There's so much stuff under these hyacinth mats for those, uh, for the sacrilege to eat. So, I mean, it's just kind of a perfect storm situation. Well, one, you know, of, the, one of the other keys to, to this fishing in these mats, it's gotta be a permanent mat. <clears throat> like this mat right here has been permanent here for a while. All the grass has grown around the lilies and everything else. So that's where you're gonna find your fish. The ones that are floating around, like what's behind the boat here, you're not, you're temporarily, <clears throat> you temporarily, you, eventually you're not gonna catch any fish in there because the fish are not gonna be hanging underneath there. They love to hang where the mat's not moving around and where, they, where it's stationary. That's where I do all my best fishing is where the mat is stationary. But it is a really neat technique and I'll promise you, there's a lot of people out there that just learned a lot about sacrilege fishing today from this trip. Because they've been fishing right down the edge of all that. And the thing about it is, no matter where you are in the state, there's something like this that exists. You know, someplace it's more that vine, like alligator weed, whatever you want to call it. And then there's lily patches and there's just all kind of stuff from the from where duckweed blows up and places where most people don't, you know, they, they stay away from it. You know, so there's that school of fish that lives under that stuff now. With that being said, this is not an easy deal. I mean, you definitely, he's prepared for it, you know, and it's a lot of work, you know, to do this. So uh, it's still not gonna be for everybody, but there's gonna be a lot of people out there saying, man, there's some of that, that same place exists on my lake at home, you know, and now I'll be able to do this. And it doesn't matter if you're in Florida, South Carolina, Arkansas, Mississippi, wherever, there, you know, vegetation grows all over the country. Uh, you know, it's a cool thing. Mr. Murphy had a boat, it was loaded out. You don't have to have a boat to do this. This can be done from the bank. I mean, I think you, you know, today there were, we saw several people you know, fishing up and down the bank. There are a lot of places all over the country from bayous to rivers where you can park and fish off the bank. The other thing about it is you can do it out of a pontoon boat, you can do it out of a bass boat, a looming boat. You know, it's kind of a, and it is a good way for a kid to fish too because the, the deal is when you pull, when you find them and you pull up on the wad, if you'd notice today where we caught them at was in a place not much bigger than this room. They were really in a condensed area, so it's easy. There could have been a group of us in the boat, three or four of us fishing in that same area, and everybody catching them. So it's really a, uh, you know, it can be a, a more of a group deal. It's a wonderful fish to eat, so 
If you want to, if you want to eat some, you need to get out there and catch them, or let's come see me and I'll give you some. <laughs> it's just a challenge to catch that fish, and, and what I like about it is uh, once you find one, generally you catch two or three. Uh, I've I've uh, I've had several trips where I'll catch 50 fish in one spot, you know, and it's all some good fish. So that's that's what I like about it. I mean, sometimes it's easy to catch your limit, sometimes it's not, you know. And there's so many opportunities to do this from, you know, all over the state, from deep reservoirs to, you know, the basin, the Mississippi River. I mean, there's just the Red River. I mean, you know, that's one thing that Cyclae exists and from one end of the state to the other. You know, some parts of the state, they're white perch. Uh, other parts, they're crappie. Here, they're Cyclae. If you go to South Carolina, they refer to them as crappie. They crappy fish out there. So. Uh, <laughs> But regardless of what you uh, call them, they are the filet mignon of the freshwater, you know. They either, they, they, if, they're gonna, if they're gonna do it and they wanna get good at it, they gotta stay at it. You can't just come fishing once in a while and thinking that's, you know, you're gonna catch fish. It's not gonna happen. You gotta stay at it, you gotta beat the bush, you gotta, you gotta do it all. Uh, and it, it, you will learn how to catch them, you know. Now it helps to have somebody that knows how to do it to teach you which I've taught a lot of people how to do it, you know? Uh, man, they love it. There we go. There's a good one. That's what I'm talking about right here. You know, see, we fishing as a team today. I like <laughs> this. I like having a partner working with me. See, this one, this one still has eggs in it. Uh -huh. This is a female here. She still has eggs. See, I go ahead and open the lid for my partner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take a chance of that thing slipping out back out of that boat. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a nice little quality fish right there. The other thing, like he was saying, like he fishes 15 or 20 different lakes just himself, but there are hundreds of places to uh, fish for cycle and crappie all over the state, from deep reservoirs like uh, Toledo Bend, which is actually world-renowned uh, cycle fishing. Uh, and some of the biggest cycle on the planet live on the Mississippi River. I mean, they actually, it's not even uncommon for them to catch three pounders over in the spring when they're, you know, big egg-laden females. I mean, so we really blessed with everything here. I mean, we again, it goes back to, I know, I, it seems like I just say this and say this and say this, but, you know, we do live in the sportsman's paradise. We're proving that here on Sportsman TV. I learned a really unique technique about catching a fish that we love to eat, and these cycle right here got a black iron pot with their name on it. We'll see you here next time on Sportsman TV.